I'm not going to talk about Apple today. Um, I should mention that there were some other people involved in uh, designing Apple.com. That sometimes gets taken out of context. <laughs> Um, my wife told me I shouldn't do this, but I feel like I owe you a little bit of a warning before I get started. This is going to be a strange talk. I've never done something quite like this before, so I'm nervous, but a little bit excited. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of justification up front for why I'm going to do this very strange talk. Um, I, as I think all of us sometimes um, in the past, have been very cynical about the potential for what we do. Um, uh, I have often said uh, in moments of frustration, it's just a website. It's not going to change the world. Let's just get over it. Um, but I do think, and we've seen a lot of the reasons, I think, today already, um, this is a uniquely exciting time to be designing interfaces and interactive uh, digital tools and, and products. Um, and I want to share with you some of the experiences and information um, recently that, have, that I've come across that have really made me feel that way. And I'm not going to tell you what to do with them. Um, I don't have a lot of advice for you today. Um, but hopefully I can share a little bit of why I'm so excited um, to be doing the work that we're doing right now at this point in the world. Let's start with my house. This isn't where I live now, um, but this is the house where I grew up. My friends said I lived in a museum, and it was kind of true. I was surrounded by collections. Victorian furniture, dusty old books, bicycles, cars, printing presses, Musical instruments, stereo equipment, computers. When my father died last year, all of these things, they were his things. They resurfaced suddenly into my life. He loved cars. This is the car he bought after his first chemo treatment. Because he said, no one's going to tell a college professor with cancer, that he can't drive a Porsche. <laughs> this is the car he drove when he took me home from the hospital after I was born. When I was a kid, he collected classic cars. They reminded him of the cars he dreamed about when he was young. When money got tight, this is the one car he didn't sell because I begged him to keep it. I drove it to my senior prom. I told him if it was my car someday, I would never sell it. We put so much of ourselves into these things, but they're just things. They're just tools. They fulfill a need. They take us where we want to go. But they're also sort of totems. They're symbols of ourselves. They're empty vessels. We fill them up with our stories. They're constantly changing to reflect our desires, our hopes for the future, and our best images of ourselves. We shape our tools and thereafter, our tools shape us. You've heard about this guy before. This is a quote from Marshall McLuhan, who was, it's kind of hard to describe, he was kind of a, he was another college professor and kind of an academic celebrity in the 60s and 70s. Um, this line comes from his book, Understanding Media, which came out in um, 1964. It's about electronic media, especially television, and how they impact our society and culture. And one of the things he says is that the things we make, 
whether it's TV or radio or telephone, each of these things creates a new environment. When you introduce a new medium, and this is one of McLuhan's favorite terms, you've probably heard his most famous phrase, the medium is the message. But when you introduce a new medium into a society, McLuhan says it changes our outlook, our attitudes, changes our feelings about how we relate to the world, changes our feelings about things like politics or about war. Even a light bulb, which doesn't have any content like television, but McLuhan says a light bulb still acts as a medium. It creates a new environment. It lengthens the workday. It changes how and when people can interact and gather. It changes how we behave, and so it changes how we think. The car is a particularly noticeable, visible example of this kind of environmental effect. The car may look very different now on the outside, but as a machine, it hasn't really changed that much in 100 years. But think about how we change the world around it. We built highways, factories, oil companies. We changed our whole environment based on the car. We changed our whole way of living. McLuhan's ideas were really fascinating and kind of weird and way ahead of their time, um, but they're difficult to communicate secondhand because the way he communicated was so unique and idiosyncratic. He was a big believer in the power of, of words combined with images and even music and wordplay and all these things in, in the service of, of, of communicating an idea. So in the spirit of that, I put together a quick video um, in the f with some of his words in the first part. Um, it's not his voice, but it's from his writing. And in the second part, I think you'll recognize the voice in the second part. All media are extensions of some human faculty, mental or physical. The wheel is an extension of the foot. The book is an extension of the eye. Clothing is an extension of the skin. Electric circuitry is an extension of the central nervous system. The extension of any one sense displaces the other senses and alters the way we think. The way we see the world. And ourselves. When these changes are made, men change. I think one of the, the things that really separates us from the high primates is that uh, we're tool builders. And I read a, uh, a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. And uh, humans came in uh, with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. It was not, not uh, too proud of a showing for the crown of creation. So uh, that didn't look so good, but then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. And that's what a computer is to me. Uh, what a computer is to me is, it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. And it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds.
That last clip is from a balloon those guys made. They attached a digital camera to it, um, and they tracked it with their iPhones so they could figure out where it landed. But they took pictures from space. It just blows my mind. We don't have to build space shuttles to change our perspective in that way. It's amazing what you can do with the right tools. You might recognize that clip. You might recognize some of the other clips from around the web. I'm very grateful to their original creators for permission to use them today. And I'll share a link at the end where you'll be able to find links to all those videos and all some of the other things that I'll reference in, in passing today um, if you're interested. And I'm sure you recognize the voice of Steve Jobs there at the end. Um, I just love that idea about computers. They're like a bicycle for our minds. It's a, it's a great way to think about tools as this empowering, almost bionic extension of our own human abilities. McLuhan had some things to say about computers too, but he was a little early. He died in 1980. Um, to see what maybe is the most uh, impactful development over the course of, of computers, which is how they've basically become invisible. This is ENIAC, what most people consider the, the first computer. And it's this enormous industrial object. It's basically a room full of tubes and switches and plugs. And you're acted with it by feeding in punch cards, pieces of paper with holes punched in them, and it would compute and process and spit a response out on the other side. Technically, it's a computer, but it doesn't look like a computer to us. It looks like something old from the past, something mechanical. This is the PDP-1, which was uh, created at MIT in 1960, about 15 years later. Um, the interesting thing about this computer is that it has a display. And a couple of years after it shows up, this guy, uh, Steve Russell, programmer, does basically the only logical thing you can do with the first computer screen, and he makes a computer game. <laughs> this, as you saw before, is Space War, one of the earliest known computer games. And it's a two-player game. Each player controls a spaceship flying around the screen, and you try and shoot the other player's ship, while, all while you're avoiding getting sucked into the gravitational field of the star in the center of the screen. I, I think it actually looks kind of fun. Um, but if you think about the kind of shift that's happening here, instead of feeding in little pieces of paper and waiting for a response on the other side, you're actually interacting directly and getting feedback on the screen. We take this for granted now, but this is like the origin story of human-computer interaction. Everything we've done in interaction design from then to now basically revolves around this one core interaction between a human and a screen. So we made the computer a little smaller. It only takes up part of the room now. Um, and we added a screen so you can functionally interact with it. Then we added the network and sort of plug all these computers together. We've heard this story. Um, but at this point, I think it's interesting something changes. Instead of adding things to the equation, we start taking things away, making them invisible. First, we get rid of the network. Create wireless networks so everything can be connected all the time, always. And we make the computer a little smaller and a little lighter until it starts to disappear too. And what we're left with, the thing that we can actually still see and interact with, is the screen. When we think about the future in science fiction, the screens are everywhere. We imagine a world where everyone wakes up and goes to work and sleeps and plays surrounded by screens. And 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, this still seemed futuristic. 
maybe even a little disturbing. But if we look around and look closely, it's really not that far from how we live. Think about it. What's your time to screen in the morning? How long does it take you to go from being dead asleep to being in front of a screen? Five seconds? 30 seconds? Maybe five minutes if you're really moving slow? And how much more of our downtime are we spending interacting in front of a screen? Waiting for the bus, reading Kindle on the train, or curled up on the couch with an iPad. All these gaps, little gaps in our lives are slowly or quickly filling up with screens. The car shaped our environment in the 20th century in this huge tectonic way. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the screen will be as important to shaping our environment in the 21st century. What goes on those screens is pretty important. Because the things that we choose to surround ourselves will shape what we become. We're not just making pretty interfaces. We're actually in the process of building an environment where we'll spend most of our time for the rest of our lives. We're the designers. We're the builders. What do we want that environment to feel like? What do we want to feel like? I'm going to leave that hanging for a bit. We'll come back to it. But first, I want to come at this from another angle. I want to start with something else. It's something that I think is pretty important to us as designers. Um, I think it's kind of a key to how we see the world, and that's simplicity. This is a recipe. It's a pretty simple recipe, not a lot of ingredients. Most of the people in the room, um, if they tried hard enough, could probably make it. <laughs> this is my friend Mark, despite being a very talented euphonium player. Up until about a year ago, Mark had never cooked anything in his life. He didn't know how to boil water. He actually got physically uncomfortable being in a kitchen. He didn't know how a stove worked. There's no such thing as a simple recipe for Mark. There's no such thing as a simple recipe for someone who doesn't know how a stove works. It starts out by explaining what fruits and vegetables look like. <laughs> There's a great apocryphal quote about interaction design that the only intuitive interface is the nipple. <laughs> Everything after that is learned. We take a lot of information and understanding for granted because we've already learned it. And as designers, we sometimes trick ourselves into thinking that our solutions are simple or that they're intuitive, when in reality, they're built on pretty complex sets of information and learned understanding. This is a great image related to the things that Craig was sharing before created by Koi Vin, and it's instructions for how to use a magazine. It's based on these instruction pages that Craig showed that started showing up in these new crop of um, iPad magazines, and they were inventing all of these you know, complex interactions and hidden tap areas to reveal control menus and, and three-finger swipes and all this stuff. So they had to invent these sort of arcane sets of hieroglyphics to explain them to these users who most of whom had no experience with this entire platform to begin with. 
So Koi made this to kind of make fun of that. Um, it's a similar instruction page for a physical magazine. And you swipe left to turn the page and fold down the corner to bookmark. And um, it's funny because we don't need instructions to use a magazine. We know how they work. But I think it also shows how complex an interface they actually are. There's a lot of learned conventions going on here, like dog-earing pages, for instance, or that you have to flip through the first few pages of full-page advertising to find the table of contents, or that the columns and shorter things go in the front and longer features are in the back. It's actually relatively complex. As designers, we're constantly making assumptions about what our audience knows, what they already have learned. How to use a mouse, for instance. At one point, every user had to learn how to use a mouse. That underlined text can be clicked on. Or that swiping your screen advances to the next frame. But those assumptions are starting to change faster than we used to in the past. It took radio about 40 years to reach a market penetration of 50 million users. Television took about 10 years to reach the same number. The iPhone took less than three years. YouTube took about six months. You may have heard some of these numbers before they get circulated a lot. It makes a very convenient point when you're trying to make a point about the pace of technological change. Um, and some people have, I think, very rightly pointed out that they can be misleading comparing apples to oranges. The adoption of YouTube is a very different thing than the adoption of something like radio, which involves a physical object that people buy in their homes and broadcast network and, and this whole infrastructure. But they both act as this kind of environmental change agent. If you think about them as tools in McLuhan's sense of the word, um, as new media creating new environments, it does indicate this sort of faster pace of change where we're creating those new environments much more quickly than we used to in the past. And we have, to, we have less time to adjust to them, to learn them. So it's not enough to just rely on what we know or what we think we know or what we expect other people to know. If the environment is always changing, we need to be always learning. And to do that, we need to let go of what we know. Buddhists call this the don't know mind. The Zen masters ask their students, who are you? You think you know, but you don't know. It's the don't know mind that's open to learning, to discovery, to seeing the truth of the, way the, of the world the way it really is, not the way we expect it to be. At times of change, the learners are the ones who will inherit the world. All the knowers will be beautifully prepared for a world which no longer exists. McLuhan said if you want a clue to this kind of rapid technological change, you should look at what artists are doing. The artist is always a jump ahead of technology and is engaged really in giving you images of what sort of effects it's likely to have upon you later on. Uh, pop art simply tells you the only art form left for you today is your own natural environment. You have now to program it as if it were a, an art, a work of art, and an environment. So uh, to suddenly be confronted with the need to use the human environment itself as art form is one way of drawing attention to the fact that the new environments created by new media require a certain amount of human programming and control e for our psychic life. This is a recent installation by the artist Robert Irwin. The way he works, he's invited to a place like the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art here. And he goes there to be what he calls available in response. He looks at the space, sometimes it's a gallery like this one, sometimes it's a public space like a park or a garden. He looks at it and he responds to what he sees. He adds something to it, or changes something, in a way that transforms the space. So when people walk into it, they experience something different. They perceive the space differently. 
And that's the art he makes. It's that experience of having your perception shifted slightly and being made aware of your own perception by having it manipulated. This is a painting he made in the 50s as what he calls a second generation abstract expressionist, sort of on the tail end of that movement to try and make these rich, exciting paintings. They're not trying to represent anything so much as they're trying to create a sense of energy and experience. As he works through these abstract paintings, one of the issues that keeps coming up for him is that people still read imagery into it. They see a cloud in the sky or a landscape or whatever. So he tries to figure out what he can do to eliminate that kind of imagery. And he creates these paintings that are basically just straight lines. So he's trying to get that same energy with fewer elements, just color and spacing and lines. Then he goes a step further. He made these paintings of alternating red and green dots, which when you stood just a few feet away, they just looked like nothing, like a plain white canvas. But if you stand there and you look at it long enough, there's an energy, they start to vibrate. You perceive the energy of the color even when you don't see anything. So with every step, he's removing elements so he can have more control. He starts to get obsessed with not just controlling the canvas, but the whole space around it. The, the walls and the lighting and the whole room. He's going into the galleries where his work is being installed at night and obsessively painting the walls and replacing the lights. And then, in 1970, a young curator at the MoMA in New York notices that one small room on the third floor of the museum will be empty for several months. And she tries to get backing for an installation by this controversial artist, Robert Irwin. They say no, but they also basically confirm that the room will be empty. So on her own authority, she invites him to come do it anyway. So he goes to New York to do an installation at the MoMA that the MoMA didn't ask for, and it wasn't going to pay for. He starts going to the museum at night after most of the visitors have left, and he stays until the guards leave, and then he comes back early in the morning before anybody arrives. And he spends his time there trying to figure out what he can do with this ugly room jammed in a corner on the third floor of the MoMA in New York. When he got there, he planned to do one of the kind of experiments he'd been doing in his studio, sort of his bag of tricks. But this room is so awkward and so ugly that it's just not working. Nothing feels right. So instead of putting something in the room, he changes the room itself. He cleans the walls and repairs the floor, and then he does three things to the room. First, he changes the lights. Um, incidentally, there's no photographs of this actual installation, and there, there's very rarely photographs of his work at all. Um, but I've used some, some photographs of some of his later work that use similar techniques, so you can kind of imagine a picture of what he was actually doing. Um, he replaces a bank of fluorescent lights in the room with these alternating war warm and cool colors. And second, he stretches a piece of piano wire right at eye level in front of one of the walls of the room, kind of the ugliest, squattest, most like intruding wall in the room. So that when you looked at it, it's hard to focus on. Your eye doesn't rest there. So he sort of removes that, that intruding wall from the space. And the third thing, he hangs a big sheet of uh, translucent uh, fabric across the ceiling, halfway across the ceiling, so that half of the lights that he installed are sort of shimmering behind it, and the other half are visible. And that's it. That's the whole installation. There was no plaque or attribution or any other signal that there was art in this room at all. As a visitor, you just had to kind of walk by this empty room in a museum and decide what was going on. If it was intentional or if it was finished, or really what exactly was happening. So that installation stays up for six months, and there's literally no reaction from the museum or from anybody. This guy basically sneaks into the MoMA where every inch of the space is carefully planned. 
and he puts his mark on a room, and nobody notices. But for Irwin, this changes the rules of everything. He goes back to his studio in LA, and he basically packs it up and shuts it down. Everything he does from that point on flows from that one room in the MoMA in New York. Everything Irwin did in that room was a response to the room itself. He didn't create the room. He wasn't in control of it. He responded to it. He added three simple things, three totally ordinary, innocuous things. But because of the way he was able to integrate them in the room, they had this impact. They became these decisive gestures. They didn't just change how the room looked, they changed how it felt. The smallest changes can be transformative, but they have to be the right changes. And discovering what those are takes patience. You have to pay attention. You have to be available in response. We've talked a lot about responsive design lately. I think it's great. I think it's one of those little shifts in thinking that cracks open a whole new set of questions possibilities. But responsiveness isn't just something we can build into our products. It's an attitude we can adopt. We can learn to listen to the changing environment, to be available in response. Like Robert Irwin in that room in the MoMA, we can come in with all our bag of tricks and all our tried and true solutions, and we can come up short. We can stay in the room, and we can keep trying until we find what fits. There's a line about architecture from John Ruskin, who is an art critic in Victorian England. He said, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for present delight nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for. We don't tend to think about the things that we build lasting very long. Websites and apps have a short half-life. Even the longest lasting platforms and operating systems are a blip on the timeline compared to a house or a car, or a chair. But you and I don't design things that stand still. We design organisms. We design ecosystems. We choose the best attributes for survival. We assemble them and shove them out into the world. And a lot of them die. But the ones that survive are the ones that adapt to the environment. They evolve, they mutate, they respond. Things we make can have such short lives that I think it can make us short-sighted. Sometimes our imaginations don't stretch that far ahead, or we don't look that far behind us for inspiration. When we design this new generation of digital tools for this ecosystem of screens, we have a longer horizon ahead of us than just the next software platform or the next version of a technology. We have a longer lineage behind us than just the web or software design or even computers. Steve Jobs said the thing that separates us from the high primates is that we're tool builders. We make things. We make things that change our lives, and we make things that change the world. This is a long and long-lasting tradition. We shape our tools, and our tools shape us. 
We're a product of our world, and our world is made of things. Things we use, things we love, things we carry with us, and the things we make. We're the product of our world, but we're also its designer. Design is the choices we make about the world we want to live in. We choose where to live, what to surround ourselves with, and what to spend our time and energy on. We make our world what it is, and we become the kind of people who live in it. When we're gone, all that's left of us is what we've made. The things you and I make may not leave a visible footprint on the earth. But everything we make takes up space, creates noise, competes for attention. What do we want to spend more time with? What do we want to shape us? What nourishes us? What do we want to see grow? I think we all have an idea. I think we all have something that we want to make for no other reason than we want it to exist. Something small, but meaningful. You know what we get to do when we leave here? We get to go make things. Things that nudge the world a little bit in what we hope is the right direction. We get to put a dent in the universe. This is a great job. Thank you.